thank you all so much for inviting me. Uh, I see lots of highs and exclamation marks in the chat. It would be great to know where you're all from, uh, countries, institutions, whatever uh, you want to share, just so that I can get a sense of um, of who's in the room. And I'll try to to multitask and, and look. So it's amazing to see so many of you, and I'm I'm so impressed that y'all are joining this Sunday morning and evening for for so many of you. Okay, so. Um, as the introduction said, I have been focusing a lot on women's leadership in global health with a particular emphasis on emerging women's leaders. So that the idea is pretty much a prevention model that right if we start thinking about leadership really on in our career, then we don't have to wait until we're at critical junctures um, to to train or to think about leadership. And in this process too, there's also a, a pretty big emphasis on building male allyship so that we can think about um, how we can all work together to promote women's leadership and, and these uh, non-male dominated processes within global health. So I'm excited to share all of this with you today. So it's been very well established that women comprise the majority of the global health workforce, over 75%, and they contribute over 3 trillion US dollars to global health care, nearly half of which is unpaid. So here we can think frontline health workers or lady health volunteers, um, but I think that's a really important distinction to make that even though they are 75% of the workforce, they are largely un or underpaid. And we know particularly if we look around in our classrooms or in our Zoom rooms that women are increasingly the majority of global health students, not just in public health, but global health more broadly. And as many as 84% of undergraduate and 70% of graduate students in global health are women. So we know that women are working hard, they're a growing part of the training landscape and they're contributing major money to the global healthcare systems. But where are women in leadership? Well, let's take a look. Here we are at the first meeting of G20 health ministers in 2017 and we've got some representation here, though not nearly close to the percentages represented in the workforce or among trainees. And here again, two years later, it's actually looking a little worse for wear, uh, certainly not even 50-50 in this G20 health ministers meeting in Japan. Now you won't find any red circles here. And this photograph made the news at the time because all of these men sitting in this room in the White House were briefing on the essential benefits for maternal health and not a single woman was present. And so, of course, we can think about the political drivers in this room and what that might mean for women's health at the time in the United States. But why do we care? We're looking at photographs and seeing women aren't making up half, certainly not even the majority of leaders in many health and global health landscapes. But why does this matter? And maybe this even touches on a root issue for this talk, right? Why do we care about women's leadership and promoting women leaders? What are the arguments? So I wanna take a quick pause and just have you let me know in the chat, why do you think women's leadership in global health matters? Okay, equal representation. So that we have a voice, different points of view, great. Leaders who are representative of a population, excellent. Yeah, provides a different perspective that we might be missing. Right, okay, global health equals inclusivity. That's a very um, positive view of global health. Equal rights, because it affects us too, yeah. A say, I like this, someone said a say in the decisions that affect us. That is exactly right. Okay, so let's first think about women themselves who have unique health related interests, right? They make up just over half of the world's population. They experience more years than men of life lost due to disability, and they bear unique burdens of disease and death. So they need to be in leadership to have their issues represented, which we certainly know wasn't happening in that White House room in 2017 uh, in the room full of men. But we also know that women's representation in leadership brings about the representation of sometimes overlooked or marginalized groups, including women and the poor. So more women in leadership means broader representation for other groups as well. And later in this talk, we'll also talk about intersectional identities and what that means for women leaders around the world. 
But the point that really drives it home for me personally is that leadership is access to money, which is access to decision-making and the prioritization of issues. That is what gets addressed and by whom is driven by who sits among the leadership. And if women are part of that group, then they have real power to drive prioritization and how money gets spent globally. But we know that decision-making bodies are still disproportionately male. And this is true in management, on governing boards, in executive leadership, in academia, you name it. So we're gonna take a minute to review some data that really looks at where women are in global leadership. Every year, Women in Global Health follows the World Health Assembly in large part to advocate for gender parity in the assembly's leadership. In 2021, they released these numbers and counted the number of women-headed WHO member state delegates, which was 26%. And this is just 3% more than the previous years, with minimal gains made across each of the WHO regions. And I think it's important to note that in 2010, over a decade ago, there were only 21% of WHO delicate states run by women. So this, these increases from 21 to 26 is pretty abysmal. And in their statement at the time, Women in Global Health said, at this rate at which gender equality is progressing, we will not achieve gender parity for another 40 years. We cannot wait that long to include women in critical decision-making that affects them the most. This is an update from this year, uh, World Health Assembly 75. And the results were upsetting, right? So here on the previous slide, 26% in 2021, 2022, 23%. So this lost a ground by a margin of 3% in a single year. And again, in their statement, they said, this data is brightly illuminating the long-term trend of women kept out of the decision-making room. A trend that means for every woman's voice, there are three men making decisions on health on behalf of women. As we look more broadly within the global health landscape, we see that globally 29% of CEOs were women in 2018, with a 1% increase over two years to 30% in 2020. These numbers stay pretty consistently low among global health UN agencies like UNICEF, WHO, PAHO, UNAIDS, and within global health initiatives that many of us are very familiar with, like PEPFAR, GAVI, PMI, Global Fund, Basically, if you use this as a parameter for a type of organization where you might like to work in global health, it's pretty consistent across the board and not so impressive. But we are seeing some positive changes over time. But I want us to take a moment to tackle this issue of the glass cliff. So many of us have heard of the glass ceiling, right? Yes, we've heard of the glass ceiling. What about the glass cliff? Does this sound familiar? All right, some had shakes, yes, some no. So when we, so you've already, sorry, with the glass cliff, right? So many of us have heard of this glass ceiling, but when we think about leadership and who takes on what kind of leadership roles, there's this phenomenon known as the glass cliff where women are more likely than men to be selected to lead failing organizations. So you're already struggling to get into leadership roles. And then the ones that are offered to you are those where organizations are already suffering. And some say this is a way for organizations to signal major changes with a culture or climate shift, right? Something really major within the organization. And that could be good. And others note that women are likely to accept these positions, right? They are more likely to accept the precarious leadership roles. So it's not just that they're offered, but that it's also women who are accepting these roles. And some researchers have explored why this is the case, and many think that it could be around internalized gender role expectations. So when you have an organization in crisis, you might need cooperation, nurturing, encouragement during tumultuous transitions. But it could also be that women have so few opportunities for leadership that they take these glass cliff positions regardless of the risk because it's their one shot to lead an organization. And turning to women in times of crisis puts them at greater risk of leadership failure. So the glass ceiling stop women, stops women from reaching leadership positions. And those few who do are more likely to be in positions with a high chance of failure. We can also think about boards and governance as forms of leadership and access to decision-making. And these trends are slightly more encouraging. 
So just over 30% of board chairs for global organizations are women, and these numbers are increasing more quickly than some other metrics in leadership. We're also seeing slow gains in political leadership globally. So only 25% of countries have a woman minister of health. But particularly around this political leadership, we know because the data show that communities governed by women leaders tend to have improved health status. And of course, in many of these settings, there are complex contextual factors, but this phenomenon has been documented in Rwanda, in Cuba and Bolivia, and also India and Pakistan, where women leaders were shown to catalyze equitable, accessible services for their communities. And these are women political leaders. Moving on and a bit close to home as an academic, women hold the least senior administrative roles and are lowest paid among academic leaders in the United States. And only approximately 14% of higher education administrators were racial or ethnic minorities, though this might be changing for the better given the political climate in the United States, particularly over the past few years. Data from the top 50 US medical schools show that 39% of faculty members at Centers for Global Health are women, and only 24% of the directors of these centers are women. And I think it's really important that we bring up this stark contrast in leadership, faculty and students as women, remember who are up to 80% of the student body in global health. As I gathered data and thought about these different issues, I knew it would be remiss to not talk about the additional barriers faced by women of color, sexual minority women, indigenous women, and women from lower income countries, all of whom remain underrepresented in global health leadership. And this is directly tied to a growing area of discussion and research in global health, which I'm sure you've all tackled in this conference, which is the movement to decolonize global health which can be thought of as the effort to remove all forms of supremacy within all spaces of global health practice, within countries, between countries, and at the global level. And supremacy is not restricted to white supremacy or male domination. And women's leadership and feminism movements have long been criticized for not being intersectional. So when we think about women's leadership and who gets to attend leadership trainings or who like you is attending this talk, we also have to consider the privileges that brought us here in the first place as we think about this issue today and ensure that our own leadership doesn't continue to reflect and only support those with our privilege. All right, so clearly now after 17 minutes, you're all very uplifted. I've painted such a rosy picture, right, of where women stand in global health leadership. But I think it's important that we start to consider what do we do now? Right, women comprise the majority of the global health student body and workforce, and they're pretty critical to decision making globally, though perhaps that's represented more at the household level than at the global leadership level. Women are grossly underrepresented in leadership across these many sectors and leadership, as I argue, is access to decision making and prioritization. And so we have to keep considering this, whether we are women whether we are non-binary, whether we are trying to create allyships, right, that there is something really critical about leadership and representation and what that means on the global health scale. So now that we've established a bit about where we are in women's leadership, I want us to all better understand some of the barriers that women face. So when developing this lecture, I quickly Googled leader and I went to the images tab. And I was curious to see what images immediately surfaced. What is the search engine pulling up if I simply type leader? And at first I was pleased to see it wasn't a bunch of photographs of men, but looking more closely, even these clip art style images feature male forms, male bodies as leaders. And it wasn't until I looked at the 11th image that I found a woman featured as a leader in lieu of a male form or a gender neutral form. And that exercise is just one demonstration of gender bias, the powerful yet often invisible barriers to women's advancement that arise from cultural beliefs about gender, as well as workplace structures, practices, and patterns of interaction that inadvertently favor men. Even in stick figure form, it's difficult for women to see images of themselves portrayed as leaders. So let's think about the conceptualizations of some leadership traits based on traditional male models of leadership. Even something as simple as extrovert versus introvert. 
where extroverts are seen as more male and more prone to leadership. You could also think about what it means to dress like a leader, right? Consider for a moment in your head what this looks like. Culturally, this can vary really widely, and I can certainly think of settings in both Africa and South and Southeast Asia where traditional dress is still worn among both men and women leaders. But we also see a lot of conformity around conservative styling and Western styling, and that can mean covering up, and it can mean conservative fashions like suits, pants, jackets. And I think we don't often look at a very feminine image, perhaps a woman in a flowery, flowing dress with lots of makeup and jewelry and think leader. So then within workplaces, many women continue to face overt and covert discrimination, being made to feel inferior, being discouraged from promotions based on gendered assumptions, and then more covertly, perhaps on perceptions of competence and worth. In my own professional experience going up for promotions, I've been told that I overstate my accomplishments and qualifications. And while certainly I am not afraid to put myself forward as a leader, I really questioned at the time and continue to question if a male colleague in the same position would have ever been told the same. Let's take a moment to more deeply consider the role of intersectional identities and leadership, particularly race and racism. So Zahara Zanali et al. wrote a commentary in 2019 and said, recognizing the dynamic interconnectedness of gender with other social identities and stratifiers, especially when considering women who do not fit the descriptions of how most women in leadership positions are represented, is integral to developing solutions that benefit all women and to allowing the potential of a truly diverse global health workforce to be tapped into. So in addition to the glass ceiling that many women face, right, we also know that there are intersectional barriers that many groups face as well. And one here that I've, just one example that I've uh, added to this slide is that individuals of Asian descent, Asians and Asians Amer Americans also face something coined the bamboo ceiling, which is a representation of racism that reaffirms the model minority myth the stereotype that all Asians are hardworking, rule abiding, independent, intelligent, and economically prosperous, which actually serves to hide anti Asian racism through a perception of privilege. And while no group is, is a monolith, right, these certainly, these certainly uh, seek to reaffirm certain myths. So if you think about the myth, for example, as Asians as submissive. And then you also think of myths around women, right, and ideas of women's leadership, then you can then see how perhaps Asian and Asian American women would face additional barriers when it comes to perceptions of leadership. Who is a leader? And these are largely based in our own biases, our own implicit biases. But again, let's remember, of course, no group is a monolith. You know, when we talk about some of these myths in medical schools, we see that there is an overrepresentation of East and South Asians, while Southeast Asians are grossly underrepresented. So we might have these ceilings, these myths, right, that are that are reaffirming some of uh, some of the biases that exist within leadership. But each of these needs to be more deeply dug into. You have to disag disaggregate data, right, which we'll talk about as we move through to the end as well. There's a great paper in The Lancet by Jyoti Madhad and her team called The Female Global Health Leadership, Data-Driven Approaches to Close the Gender Gap. And in this paper, they report data from a study where they recruited women from colleges in the US and three international affiliates in Haiti, Tanzania, and India. 29% of participants, so approximately 120 individuals, reported experiencing unwanted sexual advances in the workplace, and 7% felt coerced to engage in unwanted sexual behavior. Of those, only 35% reported. Now, I think the tone and tenor of the conversation around reporting has changed over time, but there is often an exacerbation around underreporting for women, right? Why not report sexual assault? So when asked, these women said they assumed it was normal, which I think is closely tied to not having women mentors and networks to discuss these issues and to denormalize this type of behavior. They felt it wouldn't be resolved. So that's an organizational issue and a trust issue. No reporting system existed or they weren't aware of one. So it's important to right, have awareness of policies and procedures in place. And then of course, fear, 
fear of repercussions. So not being promoted, not being given opportunities, and of course, fear of not being believed. That same study reported that 78% of respondents indicated work-life balance was a challenge. Now, I'll admit this is a topic I tend to avoid in many of my talks and seminars, largely because I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all answer. And not all people want children, right? And so this can become a very uh, a sort of distancing conversation, right? But work-life balance isn't just about children. And it can be deeply personal and depend largely on what it is you have going on in life. But at the same time, there's a major organizational role here in supporting the choices that women and men make in their personal lives, whether it's to have a family or not, whether it's to live and work internationally or not, or whatever other choices you might want to make, the organizations you're affiliated with play a major role in supporting or not supporting that. So of those who said work-life balance was a challenge, 47% stated that global health work resulted in insufficient time with their families, and 37% reported that it negatively affected their child-bearing decisions. And research has shown that female scientists have fewer children than their male counterparts. And as I just stated with the survey results, women have admitted to having fewer children than desired due to work concerns. There's also an additional tension in global health of spending time abroad. And the expectations for junior scientists to spend substantial time working overseas with partners. Now, I don't argue that this isn't important. And as we also have increasingly talked about uh, activities to decolonize global health, we know that substantial time and commitment is needed to foster equitable partnerships. So here now we have to balance the personal, the organizational, and this global issue but also consider what it means for women's careers, their ability to foster partnerships, how that partnership is valued by the organization in order to conduct work that propels forward their careers. And all of this is exacerbated by ongoing inequities in the home. So here I also mean the added physical and emotional labor that women experience as primary caretakers of the home. And I even certainly consider my own marriage to my spouse to be fairly equitable, but even as the instructor of a women's leadership course, the designer of a women's leadership network, you know, coming here to talk to you today about this, I know that I continue to face significant additional burdens related to the home, particularly in terms of emotional labor. And this isn't even to speak to the far greater inequities that many women face internationally with severe power differentials and substantially greater risk of gender-based violence in the home. Networks and mentorship are widely accepted as vital for leadership, and they're at the core of many leadership development programs, but they are largely based on traditional male models of mentorship and of networks. So come tell me in the chat, like what comes to mind when you think of the word networking? Like how does it make you feel? What does it make you think of when you think networking? Communication, connection, business. Okay, collaboration, reaching out. But how does it make you feel? Like when you think of networking, are, are you like, yes, I really wanna do that? Or like, no, that makes me uncomfortable. It feels difficult, anxiety. Okay, excited, great. Uncomfortable, complicated. Nervous to impress, that's a really great one to explore. Overwhelming, uncomfortable. Okay, so what I'm seeing is a lot of people in the chat are saying it's exciting, but there are a lot of anxieties, don you know, feelings of being daunting, um, mixed, yeah, mixed feelings. Okay, great. So men's professional networks tend to be used for practical reasons, while women's networks tend to be leveraged for relationship building. So how and when networking occurs or is perceived to occur is also important. Now, one of the things that traditionally comes to mind when you think of networking might be happy hours or afternoon events, after work events, right? These are traditional models that can exclude women who often are primary caretakers and also traditionally exclude those who don't drink alcohol, such as pregnant women and many Muslim women. Right, that when we think of traditional models for networking, what it might look like, 
it is exclusive, not inclusive. And that might be why some of you are having feelings of anxiety or feeling daunted by the idea of networking, because it can also be perceived as very hierarchical, right? That when you network, you might be trying to find a mentor or find someone to work with, and that can mean hierarchical relationships. But networks don't have to look like this, and many networking uh, initiatives, particularly around women's leadership, have been developed to rethink what networking looks like, right? Where it can occur, and I think major shifts also happened during pandemic, where networking started to be moved online, where many people could feel more comfortable, right? And in peer groups, not always hierarchical groups. Now, mentorship is also critical, but most senior leaders in positions to mentor tend to be male, right? If we're looking at who are the leaders and who are the students, there's a mismatch. And many senior women are also, also overwhelmed with requests to mentor because there are so few of them and even fewer women of color. And their time isn't protected to mentor. And what that means is they aren't actually paid to mentor. They are paid to do their research, paid to do implementation, paid to do governance, whatever it is. Most organizations do not protect people's time to mentor. And so it can also feel very frustrating for junior women to find mentors who are women because there are so few of them and because their time is really, they're already overwhelmed. So now what I want to do is wrap up in this last section and think about why this matters for research and implementation. So first, remember that if representation and leadership is decision making and ability to prioritize funding. And historically, this has not prioritized the collection of data on certain groups or the analysis of data where it does exist. That can include women, but it can also include other marginalized minorities. So we have to consider what data is collected what data is used, how is it used, and by whom? Who is making the decisions based on what data? I've also just talked now about women's networks and how they tend to be used for relationship building purposes, which makes them excellent candidates to move forward stakeholder engagement initiatives. And stakeholder engagement is critical in my own field of implementation science because to understand what will work in a given setting, you have to deeply understand its context, which you cannot do in a vacuum. But stakeholder engagement also rep represents an opportunity to display our power and privilege. When we think about who gets brought to the table, we generally think broadly of a few categories, perhaps researchers, decision makers, implementers, practitioners, and often there's an other group, right? But that other category being lumped like that leaves a lot of room for interpretation and determination. Who are they? Why do they matter? And essentially from a hierarchical perspective, what do they have to offer? And a growing area of interest of mine is not just thinking about who is at the table, right? Who, which stakeholders are there, but how do we make that table an inclusive one where everyone feels that their voice matters, is heard and will be used? that they can share and receive knowledge and that it will be valued and valuable to them. So let's first explore the concepts of data, what is collected and how it's used globally. And this slide shows us different problems with data at the production, analysis, and dissemination stages. For example, having a total lack of surveys or inappropriate survey design, we see this a lot. Flawed data collection approaches, no disaggregation of data, and a lack of communication and dissemination strategies. So really we can start to see gender biases at every stage of the, of the data planning, uh, production, analysis, and dissemination process. And these data gaps arise due to various reasons and require a holistic approach to be narrowed and closed. UN Women explores why gender data is missing and notes that countries often don't invest in collecting gender statistics or data on issues facing women and girls are not collected frequently. And there is a knowledge gap on collecting data on new and emerging issues. 23% of available data is from 2010 or later, and 16% is available for two or more time points for gender specific indicators related to the SDGs. And I argue again that women's leadership is representation and decision making and ability to prioritize issues relevant for women and girls and other minorities. 
And that one critical step is in prioritizing appropriate data collection and dissemination. Stakeholder engagement is a critical component of many implementation research frameworks, which note the central role of context and the importance of relationship building. And even work to generate core competencies in implementation research places stakeholder identification, engagement, and collaboration at the very center. And it should, I developed this framework. So clearly the field recognizes the value of stakeholders, but who is represented as a stakeholder and who gets to decide? Oftentimes at the community level, right? We talk about community leaders or religious leaders, but in many contexts, these tend to be men. So are women's interests and minority interests being represented. And this leads me to my final connection to epistemic injustice. Epistemic wrongs are moral wrongs that occur in processes involved in knowledge production, use, or circulation, when the knowledge held by people who belong to marginalized groups is systematically afforded less credibility, and where members of those groups are unable to use the knowledge they receive because it was produced in isolation from them. This description comes from an article about epistemic injustices in academic global health with a focus on peer review publications. So that is what knowledge is produced and valued in these settings and how marginalized groups are unable to use that knowledge because it was produced in isolation from them. And credibility of knowledge is linked to historical patterns of social relations, including racism, sexism, colonization, in systems where one group's credibility's excess comes at the expense of a marginalized group's credibility deficit. In women's leadership, we've seen women's knowledge and approaches devalued, while men's approaches are overvalued. And this has had significant bearing on our current methodologies, approaches, and considerations broadly in the field of global health. So if representation is power and decision-making, then we should be fighting for that representation at every level and working to create spaces where representation isn't just diversity, it's also inclusion and belonging. Mm.